This is the Kranji War Cemetery in Singapore. Buried here are the remains of about 5,000 Commonwealth soldiers. And inscribed on the walls of several memorials here are the names of another 24,000 soldiers whose bodies were never recovered during the Japanese invasion of Singapore in World War II. The invasion by the Army of Imperial Japan took place on 8 February 1942. The crossing of the Japanese army through the Johor Straits into Singapore took place less than 6 kilometers from this spot. And within the next 8 days, the Japanese army defeated the numerically larger British forces, leading to the surrender of Singapore on the 15th of February 1942. Much has already been told of how Singapore fell, of how the Japanese marauded through the Malayan Peninsula on bicycles, how they employed tanks through the jungle when they said it was impossible, of how the British commanders blundered from mistake following mistakes, of miscommunication, unprepared defences or just bad strategy. The story of the fall of Singapore has been told and retold many times. One interesting fact you get when you visit this war memorial is that on many of the gravestones are marked with a location called West Bukit Timah, where the soldiers fell. Ever wondered where this location was? In this video, I'm going to focus on one of the lesser known battles between the British Empire against the Japanese Empire the battle that occurred at West Bukit Timah. This was the Battle of Bukit Batu, which was a prelude to the capture of Bukit Timah village, one of the main strategic objectives of the Japanese army during the invasion. The Battle of Bukit Batu was a series of skirmishes that occurred on the 10th and 11th of February that resulted in the death of more than 1,000 Allied soldiers and a smaller but unknown number of Japanese soldiers. Though not often mentioned in official Western war history, the battle at Bukit Batu can be gleaned from official records of the units that fought there. Records from the 2nd Australian Imperial Force, the 15th Indian Infantry Brigade, the British Battalion, and from the personal diaries of soldiers who survived the ordeal. Another major source of information of this battle comes from a very detailed Japanese studies map which came into my hands a few years ago. From this map, you get to see the movement of every Japanese unit and their progress recorded in time as they pushed forward. And from this, you get a new understanding of how and why the Imperial Japanese Army advanced the way they did through Singapore. This Japanese map also answers a few burning questions, like why strategic places like Kalang Airfield wasn't taken when they could, or why didn't they advance beyond Mount Faber in their headlong push to the city. But that's another story for another time. We begin the story of the Battle of Bukit Batu by briefly returning to the day the Japanese crossed the Straits of Johor and initiated the invasion of Singapore Island on 8 February 1942. By 7 February, the 25th Army Group, led by Lieutenant General Tomoyuki Yamashita, was already at the shores of the Johor Straits, waiting for the right moment and opportunity to invade Singapore Island. Yamashita planned the invasion into three areas of operation. His 18th Infantry Division would take the Western Sector. The Imperial Guards Division would take the Eastern and Northern Sectors, while the 5th Infantry Division would cover the corridor between the two other divisions. The City of Singapore would be under the command of the Field Military Police, the dreaded Kempei Itai. The invasion began midnight 7th February with a ruse landing at Pulau Ubin by a battalion of the 1st Imperial Guards. 
Their tactic was to openly and visibly cross into the lightly defended Pulau Ubin to set up artillery batteries to shell the northeastern shores around Changi. By 9 a.m., they were in position and began their barrage that was to last the whole day long. This was in conjunction with all other artillery units along the Johor coast opening up and battering the entire length of the northern shore of Singapore, especially in the northwestern region around Lim Chu Kang. At precisely 8.30 p.m. that night, the 5th and 18th Division began the crossing of the Johor Straits onto the beaches at Serimbun. By midnight, as many as 3,000 troops had crossed and were starting to overwhelm the sparsely manned Australian front lines, aggressively pushing them back. By 9 a.m. in the morning, the invading Japanese troops had advanced up to Amaking village along Lim Chukang Road, just beyond the Tenga airfield. At this same time, the Imperial Guards Division landed at Kranji and opened a second battlefront. Realising that they could be overrun in the Western sector, Australian Division Commander Major General Gordon Bennett pulled the 44th Indian Brigade back from the Western Tuas coastline area to the Jurong Brickworks area to form a defensive line. By 12 noon, the Japanese had captured Tenga Airfield and the Australian Infantry Brigade moved back to defend a new line at Bulim Village. The British forces were now at a switch line, a military term for a defensive position facing the enemy, between the Kranji River in the north and the Jurong River in the south. The Special Reserve Battalion and the Reserve 15th Indian Brigade were called in to reinforce the blockade. It would be known as the Kranji Jurong Switch Line, where it was hoped that they would stop the Japanese from advancing. This is a view taken in 2022 of the once hilly region of Bulim in the west of Singapore looking over the area where 80 years ago the British forces attempted to stop an invading Japanese army by forming a blockade called the Kranji Jurong Switch Line. Today, the ongoing development of Tenga New Town will completely wipe away all traces of the hills and battlefields that once played a significant part in the invasion of Singapore in World War II. To give you a modern day perspective, this view is from Bukit Batok West, about 2 kilometers further back looking towards the same Bulim region. The view looks towards Serimbun at the horizon on the northwest coast where the Japanese first breached the front line. This red line was where the Kranji Jurong switch line was implemented to prevent the Japanese army from passing through. The British units were positioned at the following areas. The 44th Indian Brigade was at the southern end, a strike Jurong Road at the 11th milestone over the Jurong River. The 15th Indian Brigade protected the line around the Jurong and Nanyang Brickworks area. The Australian Special Reserve Battalion was entrenched at the Bulim Rubber Estate around Hill 110. Brigadier Taylor's 22nd Australian Brigade that had been pushed all the way back from the Surimbun Beach Landing Zone occupied the northern area beside the Kranji River. They formed the line just outside of Tenga Airfield along Chua Chukang Road. 
However, this crunchy Jurong switch line did not hold for very long. Under constant mortar, artillery and aerial bombardment, the frontline situation was always in a very confused state. Around midday 10th February, the Australian Brigade Commander, Brigadier Taylor, received Lieutenant General Percival's plan for an eventual defence of Singapore City, but misinterpreted the plan as to be immediately effective and withdrew his brigade to Reformatory Road. At the same time, Brigadier Ballantin of the 44th Indian Brigade at Jurong Road at the southern end also misinterpreted the same plan from Lieutenant General Percival and withdrew his 44th Brigade towards Pasir Panjang via West Coast Road. At 1.45pm, Brigadier J.B. Coates, holding his 15th Indian Brigade around the brickworks, was informed that the Australians in the north at Chochukang and the Indians at the south at Jurong Road had withdrawn from the Kranji Jurong switch line. Fearing that his unit was now exposed on both his northern and southern flanks, he ordered his 15th Brigade to reposition themselves 5 kilometers to the rear at the foothills of Bukit Bato. The Special Reserve Battalion, who were not informed of the withdrawal of the Australian Brigade at Chochukang, remained entrenched at Hill 110. Only late in the afternoon did the commanding officer Major Bert Sagas found out that the Allied brigades were no longer at their positions and that some Japanese forces had already bypassed his own battalion both in the north and the south of his position. He then proceeded to get his battalion out by going due east towards Bukit Gomba where they came upon a jungle track that led them eventually to meet up with the 15th Indian Brigade at Bukit Bato. It took them six hours to get from Hill 110 through the jungle in the pitch black night to eventually get to Bukit Bato. The retreat of the Special Reserve Battalion marked the moment the Kranji Jurong Line completely collapsed. At this time, when the Kranji Jurong switch line was no longer in place, the Japanese divisions could have easily advanced towards Bukit Timah village to their advantage. But it was one of those inexplicable events that sometimes occur in a war. Having secured Tenga airfield at noon, the Japanese army decided to consolidate their position then and wait for more soldiers more supplies and logistics to follow up across the Straits of Johor. This gave the retreating British forces some breathing time. So confident of their success that after they captured Tenga Airfield, their Supreme Commander General Yamashita came across the Straits and set up his field headquarters at Amakeng village, just outside the airfield. There was a lull in the Japanese advance at this time, but this was only to last for a few hours before the Japanese division began moving again in earnest. On orders from General Yamashita, Bukit Timah village was to be captured by the following day, 11 February. The 5th Division advanced down Chua Chu Kang, while the 18th Division moved southwest to follow Jurong Road towards Bukit Timah in a two-pronged maneuver to capture the British resources located around Bukit Timah village. Directly along the route to Bukit Timah was Bukit Bato, 
where the 15 Indian Brigade had taken up a defensive position and was to meet the Japanese division head on. The British Allied forces that fought at Bukit Batu were led by the 15th Indian Infantry Brigade commanded by Brigadier J.B. Coates. Under his command were three regiments, the 9th Jat Regiment, the 16th Punjab Regiment and the British Battalion, a combined formation of the 1st Leicestershire and the 2nd East Surrey Regiments under the command of Lieutenant Colonel C.E. Morrison. Attached to the brigade were also three hastily formed Australian units from the 2nd Australian Imperial Force. These were the Special Reserve Battalion led by Major Bert Sagas from the 2nd 4th Michigan Battalion, the Merritt Force led by Major Arrow Merritt and the X Battalion led by Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Boyce. The total strength of the brigade on 10 February was approximately 1,500 men. At the other end of the battlefield, the Imperial Japanese Army Force was spearheaded by their 18th Infantry Division, a battle-hardened unit led by their commander, Lieutenant General Mataguchi. In his command, he had two brigades, the 23rd Brigade led by Major General Hiroshi Takumi, whose unit had been the first to land at Kota Baru in Malaya two months earlier, and the 35th Brigade under Major General Kiyo Kawaguchi. Each brigade had two regiments under their chain of command, the 55th and 56th Regiment in the 23rd Brigade and the 114th and 124th Regiment in the 35th Brigade. The 124th Regiment was kept in reserve. Each of the regiments had three battalions of soldiers. The total estimated strength of the 18th Division on 10 February was 12,000 men, an almost eight times numerical advantage over the British forces that fateful day at Bukit Bato. This is Bukit Batu New Town today in 2022. Before the construction of high-rise apartments here in the 1980s, this was a very hilly rural area covered with small farms, brickworks, rubber estates and large areas of shrub and forest. The major features here were the hills Bukit Tima, Bukit Batu, Bukit Gombak and Bukit Panjang. This region lies immediately west of Bukit Timah Hill and in 1942 was then known as West Bukit Timah. Within this particular region, there were a number of hills that would play a significant part in the battle that was to occur here on 10th and 11th February. Bukit Bato, Bukit Gomba, and two small hills called Ball Hill and Hill 138. Both hills were astride and south of the main Jurong Road running in the valley below. Jurong Road was the only trunk road that ran from Tuas in the west towards Bukit Tima village located just 3 kilometers further down the road from this point. Locally, this area was known as the Ninth Milestone Jurong. On 10 February 1942, at 1.45, the 15 Indian Brigade began their withdrawal from the Kranji Jurong switch line. and by 4 p.m. was repositioned here at the foothills of Bukit Bato, blockading the only access road towards Bukit Tima village to the rear. The units of the 15th Indian Brigade were deployed overlooking and protected Jurong Road. The 9th Jat Regiment was deployed about one kilometer away on the southern ridge of Bukit Gomba. The 16th Punjab Regiment covered the right flank while the British battalion covered the road on the left flank. 
The Australian Special Reserve Battalion arrived in the late evening after escaping from the encroaching Japanese army at Bulim and joined the 15 Indian Brigade in defending the road. They took up a position on a bare feature on the south side which they call Ball Hill. Earlier that afternoon around 4.30 p.m., orders had arrived from Lieutenant General Percival directing the 15th Indian Brigade, the 12th Indian Brigade and the 22nd Australian Brigade to counter-attack and retake the abandoned Kranji Jurong switch line the following day, 11th February. It was to be in three phases. The first phase was to position, prepare and wait until reinforcement arrived later that day. For the 15 Indian Brigade at Bukit Batu, they would be reinforced by 200 men of X Battalion and 180 men from the Merit Force. Both composite units hastily put together, mainly with soldiers that had straggled from the Lim Chukang front lines earlier. The second phase was the movement to retake the Kranji Jurong Line starting at 5.30 a.m. the next morning. The 12th Indian and the 22nd Australian Brigades, then positioned at Bukit Panjang, would advance along Chua Chukang Road towards Bulim Village. The three Australian battalions at Bukit Batu, namely the Special Reserve, X Battalion and Merit Force, would advance down to the 11th Milestone Jurong Road to form the southern line around the Jurong and Nanyang brickworks. The 15th Indian Brigade would cross the hills of West Bukit Timur through the Bulim Rubber Estate to fill the gap in the centre of the switch line between the British Brigades at Chuachukang and the Australians at Jurong Road. X Battalion arrived late in the evening and was deployed at Hill 138. The men of X Battalion were so exhausted that once settled in, almost all of them fell asleep at their post. Merit Force had difficulty finding their way in the pitch black night, got lost and decided to camp about 2 kilometers south at Hill 186 in the Toguan Forest. Throughout the night, sporadic small arms and mortar fire were directed at the entrenched British forces by Japanese scouts and forward platoon soldiers. Sniping fire from the left, the front and right of their position indicated that the Japanese forces were trying to surround the British at Bukit Batu. At 3 a.m., the 2nd and 3rd battalions of the Japanese 56th Regiment manoeuvring down Jurong Road came upon the unwary X Battalion on Hill 138 and in the ensuing firefight decimated the Australians. Everyone was so tired. Everyone laid down and slept. Next thing they opened up on us. That's when Major O'Bine gave the order, every man for himself. The enemy mortar shell got a petrol dump nearby and lit up the scene. Struggling figures silhouetted against the leaping flames from the oil dump. The crashing explosions of mortar bombs and the grenades and the rattle of small arm fire, providing a sickening orchestration to add to the screams and cries of the wounded and dying. Of the 200 Australian soldiers, only 40 managed to escape into the forest. At 4 a.m., continuing their relentless drive through Bukit Bato and the Toguan area, 
the 55th Regiment encountered Merit Force on the slopes of Hill 186. There they routed Merit Force, killing 90 of the 180 men. This was the situation just before dawn 11 of February. During the previous night, the Japanese 5th Division, led by Lieutenant General Matsui, had advanced down from Bukit Panjang and were already at the outskirts of Bukit Timah village, which had been shelled throughout the entire night. The Japanese 5th Division did not cross Jurong Road into Bukit Bato as it was beyond the boundary of their area of operation. Thus, the 15th Indian Brigade had a small respite from being attacked from that direction. But it also prevented their retreat via the Jurong Road route. The British forces at Bukit Bato were harassed throughout the night with small arms and mortar attacks. The Special Reserve Battalion had moved to Wall Hill and took a new position beside the British Battalion. They managed to hold their line through the entire night. The Japs pushed up to our line, firing around and dodging behind trees, crawling along drains and using every fold in the ground. Many had cut a bush and used this to push in front of them as they crawled forward, while others smeared mud and clay over their faces and clothing. At 4am, Brigadier Coates rescinded General Percival's order to retake the Kranji Jurong Line as the Japanese army began to surround his forces. His brigade was to prepare to exfiltrate the area at first light. Brigadier Coates knew by now that they were surrounded on three sides and the only way out was across the jungle, farmlands and rubber plantations in the southeastern direction to reach friendly forces at Ulu Pandan. At 5.30 a.m., the Jat Regiment stationed at Bukit Gombak, not being informed of the withdrawal and cancellation of Percival's order, began their counter-attack as planned, heading to Bulim to retake the Kranji Jurong Line. The Jat Regiment was to suffer heavy casualties from this blunder. At 7.30 a.m., in order to secure a safe withdrawal, RSM Warrant Officer John Meredith led a company of men from the British Battalion on a frontal bayonet charge towards the Japanese attackers. Seeing this, E Company of the Special Reserves joined in the charge to push the Japanese soldiers back. They succeeded in forcing the Japanese soldiers away from the front line, killing 14 soldiers and capturing two prisoners. The bayonet charge created a safe window of time for the 15th Indian Brigade to immediately withdraw from the area. For his heroic action at Bukit Bato, RSM Meredith was later awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal, second only to the Victoria Cross. The exfiltration route would take them across Sleepy Valley Rubber Estate, following the rough jungle tracks on a 140-degree compass bearing a distance of about 5 kilometers to the safety of the Ulu Pandan front line. The planned order of retreat was to form three columns, Indians on the left, Aussies in the center, and the British soldiers on the right. In the frenzied rush to withdraw, the Indian units made an error and fouled out on the right side of the other columns, a seemingly minor error but one that would have serious consequences to come. Though Brigadier Coates knew he was already being caught in an ever-shrinking circle, he didn't really know how close the Japanese had actually come upon his brigade. During the night before, the Japanese 55th and 56th regiments had already bypassed him and had reached Sleepy Valley decimating X battalion and merit force in their advance. Strategically, the Japanese brigade commander, Lieutenant General Mataguchi, had already predicted that the isolated Indian brigade would make a run for 
to Southwest Bukitima. Thus, he ordered his 55th and 56th regiments to lay a trap for the British units in an area where they would be hemmed in completely. The place chosen was Sleepy Valley Rubber Estate. The hills on which the rubber trees grew overlooked an open depression in the valley below and would be ideal for an ambush. When the British retreat began, the Japanese 2nd and 3rd battalions took up positions behind the retreating British troops. The trap was set and primed to go off when the retreating soldiers arrived at Sleepy Valley. About a mile from a formatory road, we reached open country. It had to be crossed. The area resembled a small saucer about 500 yards by 400 yards. A few trees and shrubs with grass about six inches high with some huts in the centre. In the centre were a few native huts. The column had reached about 150 yards from the huts when suddenly, without the slightest warning, small arms fire was directed at us from all directions. Once most of the British troops entered the killing zone, all hell broke loose. Machine guns fired from the surrounding hills with mortar shells bursting all around the soldiers. In the words of a Japanese company commander, it was like shooting ducks in a pond. The Allied soldiers were in complete disarray, with the Indian file breaking and scattering all over the battlefield, crossing the British and Australian lines trying to seek cover. This made control of all the troops near impossible. It was each man for himself now. An Indian soldier who tried to raise a white flag in surrender was promptly shot by his own officers. Despite the sudden ambush, there were many acts of individual bravery as the men tried to stem the onslaught and to cover their comrades. Lieutenant Victor Warhurst, a 2nd 4th Machine Gun Officer, led a bayonet charge with a company of East Surrey troops, which momentarily halted the enemy. Lieutenant Warhurst was killed in action while trying to flee from the ambush. Lieutenant Victor Mantiple from the Special Reserves was so angered by the sight of Japanese soldier bayoneting wounded Australians that he charged the enemy soldier. Mantiple fell back or stabbed by the soldier's bayonet, but then pulled out his revolver and shot the enemy. He then proceeded to kill another five Japanese soldiers. Threw his empty revolver at a Japanese machine gun position. The gun crew thought the revolver was a grenade and fled. Lieutenant Mantiple was to survive the ambush by hiding in a duck pond until cover of night. By 12 noon, the battle was essentially over. All the British units had completely scattered. Some made it to safety, some hid in the forest, and a few actually made their way to the west coast but most of the Allied soldiers who entered Sleepy Valley that morning didn't survive that fateful day. At this same time, the 5th Division of the Imperial Japanese Army, fighting another group of Allied soldiers some distance away, reported to General Yamashita that Bukit Tima village 
had been taken and secured. It was now in Japanese hands. After the fall and surrender of Singapore, a count of survivors was done in the various POW camps. Only an estimated 400 soldiers who had fought at Sleepy Valley could be accounted for. The actual number of soldiers killed at Bukit Batu is unknown, as some had escaped and were not captured as POWs. Some made it out of Singapore by their own means. Even so, it was estimated that about 1,000 Allied soldiers perished in that two days of battle at Bukit Batu. Ten months after the surrender in December 1942, a team of Australian POWs were given permission to return to Sleepy Valley to look for the bodies of their slain comrades. Led by Major Sagas of the Special Reserve, they found 50 bodies on their first search and buried them in a common grave. And on the second search, found and re 32 bodies at a mass grave on a spot where today sits the Eng Kong Garden housing estate. After the war, these bodies were exhumed and reburied at the Kranji War Cemetery. This is an aerial view of the area where the battle occurred on the 10th and 11th of February 1942. Today it is completely built up with little traces left of the battlefield. The Bukit Batu area has many sensitive installations which makes it basically a no-fly area for drones. Therefore, the next best thing is to give you an overhead view with Google Maps. In 1942, this area was all countryside farms, or jungle. From the collapsed Kranji Jurong switch line, the Imperial Japanese Army moved through Bulim, encountered the 15th Brigade at Bukit Bato, decimated both ex battalion and merit force, and finally ambushed the 15th Brigade at Sleepy Valley. This is Bukit Batok Hill today where the Media Corp TV transmission towers are. The 15 Indian Brigade were camped at the foothills here. Jurong Road, which the 15 Brigade tried to protect, is today part of the Bukit Batok Nature Park and is in fact the only surviving remnant of the old Jurong Road. Bald Hill, where the Special Reserve Battalion dug in on the night of 10 February is where the Franciscan Church of St. Mary of the Angels is now located. In the 1970s, 30 years after the war, when the Franciscans were building the church, the friars found trenches and even a relic artillery shell that was embedded in the hillside. When Father Brendan and I cut down the jungle, we discovered two long trenches that were still there, but it didn't cross our minds to record it on film. We also unearthed a bombshell there and had it removed by the army at the time the excavators then came in to build a hall over that very spot. Yes, we knew the Aussies had fought at that place. The former Jurong Road used to run just at the base of this ball hill. In 1990, when the Housing and Development Board started to clear the jungle around Ball Hill in preparation to build new apartment blocks, they found two Japanese war graves with their memorial stones still intact. 
The graves belong to Corporal Iseke Ujiro and 2nd Lieutenant Fuji Nosuke Tomita. Their graves, being at Ball Hill, might possibly indicate that they were killed during the bayonet charge led by RSM Meredith that morning the Indian Brigade withdrew from Bukit Batu. On the right of this road called Bukit Batu East Avenue 6 today was where Hill 138 was, where the hapless ex-battalions were annihilated by the 55th Regiment the night they slept. Today the hill has been levelled and new industrial factories are located on the same site. This is the Bukit Batu Town Park known locally as Little Quilin. In 1942, there were no cliffs nor granite quarries but a hill with a rubber plantation on it. On the southern slope of this hill Bukit Gombak, which then overlooked Jurong Road, the unfortunate 9th Jat Battalion was entrenched here before leaving to take the switch line, not knowing that the order had been cancelled. This was Kampong Ulu Pandan at the 10th milestone Jurong Road. It was the centre of the area because it was a market town. The Japanese 56th Regiment set up their regimental headquarters just here in preparation for the attack at Bukit Batu. Today, it is the town centre for Bukit Bato New Town West. This is Hill 110 at the former Bulim Rubber Plantation. Tenga New Town is being built over the entire region now. Today, it takes less than 10 minutes to drive through the entire Sleepy Valley region. With good roads and development, we find it hard to imagine what it was like in 1942. Here are some pictures taken from Ulu Pandan where the 56th Japanese Regiment had their field headquarters while attacking the British both at Reformatory Road and Sleepy Valley. This is a 1961 photo of the building of the Ulu Pandan Sewage Works. It is exactly over the spot of the 55th Regiment field headquarters. The hills behind are dead of Sleepy Valley. In this picture of the same area before the building of the sewage work, you get an idea of how dense the forest of the Toguan area was, where the British and Japanese soldiers had to go through. Bukit Timah Hill can be seen in the far background of the picture. This is a rare aerial survey photo taken by the RAF of West Bukit Timah in 1950 over the Sleepy Valley region. You can see how difficult it might have been to cross the hills then, as well as how easy it might have been to set up an ambush here. I hope you have enjoyed my retelling of the Battle of Bukit Batu. If you like to see more of these videos, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, give this video a like, click on the notification bell and you'll be informed when my next video is uploaded. Thank you for watching. Please stay safe and goodbye.